This is lecture number 23. Today we're going to be talking about traffic flow and some basic parameters and some measurement units that we use for traffic flow, uh, more or less on a daily basis. Uh, we look at our even peak hours you know, through there. Before we've looked at more of the microscopic traffic flow or uh, smaller segments of it and how delay works and how to calculate delay and so forth. Now this is a little bit more of a macro view of traffic flow. And then we're also going to look then at traffic signals and get an introduction to, to some terminology that we use for traffic signals. That's our next chapter in our book, and so we'll be moving into that uh, today as well. Right, through there. Uh, the first two terms we've got are ADT and AADT. Uh, they're obviously they look very similar, and they do they are very similar uh, in what they are. Um, what they are is we have average daily traffic. It's ADT. That's if you put traffic counters out, usually it's like a road tube or sometimes a magnetic detector out in the road. And sometimes you can use a little video as well. You count cars for uh, typically more than a day. We like to do 48 hour counts. And so for two days running, we'll do uh, counts. We average those two days together, or maybe it's three days or maybe it's four days. You average that all together. That's your ADT. Right. And that's at a, sp a specific time during uh, the year. So if we did it now, uh, we'd be looking at in March. This would be our average daily traffic for a few days in March. And that's useful. That's, that's important. Um, but we also want to average that out over an entire year, and that's AADT. And so we adjust those, those individual ADT calculations and so like we did one for March, we could adjust that and say, well, how does that compare um, to June or to October or to December, right? So during the year, traffic changes. And so you'll have busier, busier times uh, during certain points of the year. So usually summer has higher traffic volumes, uh, sometimes right before Christmas and so forth. Uh, certain roads will have a higher peak in volume. Right, so to, to average all of that out, we do AADT, the annual average daily traffic. And the way we do this, are there's there are permanent test or, or count stations, not test stations, permanent count stations out on the roads, and they measure traffic 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And so we can see how many cars they counted uh, in March in that same week. We can compare that to the total number of cars counted over the year, and we can come up with adjustment factors. And so that's how we go from ADT to AADT, the annual average daily traffic. We'll do that. Uh, this is what traffic looks like during the day. And so this is an intercity route. So this is a route between two cities uh, through there. And it's uh, for a full day. So this would be the average traffic during a full, and this is a weekday. This would be the average traffic for a full weekday on that. Like the dark line is a weekday uh, traffic through there, right? And it's kind of what you might expect, right? We're going to get a peak in the morning uh, around the time people are going to work or going to school, and then it drops off. Then there's another peak around lunch where everyone's going out to lunch or running errands, and then we get a p.m. peak through that. And this is these are uh, typical drawings, and but they do match it pretty well. Typically, our p.m. peak is bigger than our a.m. peak slightly. Uh, through there, a little more going on uh, in the p.m. In the morning, most people are just going to wherever they need to get to, school or work. In the afternoon, they may also be running errands, going out to eat, as well as returning from school or work. So we get a little bit larger peak at that time. The dotted line is uh, on weekends, and so this would be like particularly a Saturday um, plot uh, for weekends. So you'll, you'll get a peak, but it's kind of early afternoon on a weekend, like through there. The dark line, solid line, is during the weekdays and so that's our uh, and so if you, if you know what your ADT is or AADT this is that percent of that vote number which is what percent is happening at what time of the day right, through that um, and then this is this is longer distance. This is out away from a city. Uh, so these are longer distance routes. This would be your interstates. This is more interstate profile. If Interstate 80, 90, about halfway across Indiana, there's not that much commuter traffic on that. And so you're going to see more of a shape like this. So a typical weekday is going to look like this. Again, we have a peak more in the afternoon. And then weekends, um, unless you peak more. So you get more people traveling longer distances on a weekend. And so you'll actually, you'll see an uptick in that traffic number uh, through that. So that gives you an idea. Uh, near near town, uh, this is what you're going to have. You're going to see these uh, commuter peaks uh, through that. If it's a commuter route through that, uh, out away from the cities, you're going to see more like this 
uh, through that. We've got seasonal variations. That's again, that's the difference between ADT and AADT. So here's our AADT, which is the, if you took all of the cars that passed a certain point over an entire year and divided by 365, this would be the number you'd get right through that. And what we see is that in the spring, we're typically lower, right? Uh, we were below the normal amount of, or the average traffic for the year. Then we get into the, the summer, we're going to go up above that. And that, that holds on even in through the fall. So we get a little more traffic through that. And then it drops again. People will have time off uh, around Christmas and so forth. And so they're not going to be in uh, doing their normal commutes. And we lose volume that way. So, and that's a that's our difference. This would be a business route. In a recreational route, you see a huge peak in the summer. So, you know, the, the roads going up to Yellowstone or Glacier and so forth, Grand Canyon, you're going to see a huge peak through the summer months because that's when most people are on vacation and are traveling through there. But that's this gives you an idea. This is our, our normal variation through the year. And that's why we, if we took right now, if we measured in March, that's our ADT, we can convert that. We can figure out what the conversion ratio is to get us back to this AADT. All right, so we can measure the traffic at any point during the year, and because of those 24-hour count stations, we can convert that back to the average annual daily traffic, the AADT, uh, through that. First term we've got, uh, our, our factors that we look at through this, our first one is this K factor. The K factor is what percent of, of the average annual daily traffic is occurring during the peak hour. Right, and that's we defined that our design hour is the 30th highest hour of traffic during the year. Through that, I'm not sure why they picked the 30th, but that's how they they check that out. And so we're using the 30th. There is always some special event that's going to be higher. That's why we don't pick the the top, right? Um, so we're looking at what to design for. We want to know what uh, amount of traffic to design for, and so we picked the 30th highest hour. If we picked the highest hour we'd have to really overbuild everything. We'd have to add a lot of extra lanes, lots of extra turn lanes, much bigger intersections to handle that one bad hour during the year. All right, so instead we do the 30th highest hour and that that's, uh, you can see how this curve works right through here. So our 30th highest hour puts us right in here. You know, this is not linear, uh, right? So to handle the worst hour, we'd have to be way up here. We'd be handling that kind of traffic. And then we don't want to uh, that's way overbuilt, right? So yes, there's uh, 29 hours of the year, you're going to feel some pain uh, through that we're designing for the 30th highest hour, as best we can approximate. And again, um, traffic numbers change every year. And so even though we, when we built it, that was our best estimate for the 30th highest, sometimes our numbers are off, right? Sometimes there's a new development built nearby, a new mall, new factory, and, and traffic shoots up unexpectedly high. And then we've got to come back and retrofit stuff through there. So our K value is we take that design hour volume, which is the 30th highest hour of the year, and we divide it by what our average annual data traffic would be for that road at that location. All right, so that's our ratio. And a normal number is about 10%. That's if you, if you have no other information, you can say, well, the design hour volume is typically about 10% of all of the cars that pass through there in the average annual daily traffic number. So that's, that's a normal number. We're going to see a chart here coming up uh, right there. It gives us kind of a ratio of what these different, um, these K factors are. Right? You can see for low volumes, uh, roads that only handle between zero and 2,500 vehicles per day on average annually through there, the K factor could be up to 15% right, through that. As volumes increase, the K factor drops, right? So again, my rule of thumb is it's about 10% of average daily traffic would be what you'd expect on the roads, right? And you can see we're running, here's 11, 10, 9, right? So that covers a pretty wide range of, of uh of different kinds of roads and different uh, traffic characteristics through that. Ideally, you've got traffic numbers and you can calculate this. You, in a typical traffic report, you're going to have what the average daily traffic is and then you're going to have what the peak hour traffic was. And then you can calculate your own K value from that. Right. So that's, that's a K is kind of a peaking factor, right? The higher that percentage is, the, the more extreme your design hour volume is versus your average, average daily traffic uh, is on there. So it's what proportion of that worst hour, uh, what proportion of all the traffic during that worst hour um, is versus all the traffic you had during the day. So that's what K value uh, tells us. Why do these numbers increase? 
um, or actually, sorry, why are they dropping as the as the traffic volume increases? Why do these K factors decrease? Hmm. What would make that happen? So the well, so if you think about this, right? So uh, US 30 out here by campus, it's 20 to 50,000 vehicles a day. That's probably roughly where we're at, um, somewhere in there, right? So we got 10, 11 percent is probably occurring during our peak hour, right? As you get into these higher numbers, you know, 100 to 200,000, this is like the Kennedy Expressway in Chicago, all right? So that's what, seven or eight lanes of traffic. And think about that traffic in the morning, right? It's, it's coming or in the afternoon during the peak times. It's probably a PM peak out there, right? They're probably running 150,000 vehicles a day and their proportion during the peak hour is less um, then the proportion during the peak hour would be if we had a lower volume. So why would that be? Right, capacity. Capacity is the problem is that they're at capacity. They can't add many, any more vehicles. And it's moving, think about it, it's usually stop and go, right? Um, you're driving 10 miles per hour, then you're up to 20, then you're back down to 10 or zero. It's, there's no extra capacity out there. So you've reached capacity. If there was more capacity, the the peak might be higher, but these those kinds of roads are busy all the time, or almost all the time, and and so their peak hour isn't as extreme because there is no extra capacity and because they're busy all the time, right? So they're handling so much traffic, they're, they're it's less of a peak, right? Think about a small country road or a, a, a street in front of your house in town or whatever, you know, there's a lot of hours of the day, probably between midnight and 4 a.m. that no one drives by, and then all of a sudden a bunch of people take off to go to school and you'll get three or four or five cars in you know, a 10 minute period or something, right? So that's a much higher peak factor. So that's why uh, as, as the ADT increases, the peak factor drops uh, through there, right? The next term is D factor. D factor is what proportion of that 30th highest hourly traffic volume, our design hour, as we call it, uh, is going in a certain direction, in the heavier direction. And so D stands for directional split. That's what we're looking at there. What do you think the normal D factor would be? Right? You might think, well, it's probably about equal, right? About 50-50. Yeah, that's true, right? And generally, you'll get um, your directional split is going to be near 50%. Uh, right through there. If you've got a heavy movement, a really heavy commute, then it's going to be uh, further off of that. Over a full day, usually it's about 50-50, right? People who go into work in the morning take the same road to come home, so uh, we do that. But during that peak hour, what's what proportion can we expect to be going in a certain direction? So that's our D factor, right? So it's through there. Uh, a D factor, it may be like 53%, maybe 55%. It'd be a normal value uh, for a D factor. Here's a table showing some uh, this based on what kind of this is for freeways what kind of uh, where your freeway is at what kind of circumstance that freeway is in it changes that that d factor that directional split right interurban going between um uh, or within town right then you are going to get that kind of even split all right these are are embedded in the city so again the kennedy inside chicago between the airport and chicago it's going to have a pretty low d factor probably because it's it's serving all around inside uh, inside town there right rural inner city ones you may have to be like 60 percent recreational ones you might get a much higher peak factor uh, through that so an directional split you see, you get both in a, a recreational one, right? Look at this high one, though. Let's look at this urban radial. What's what's an urban radial uh, interstate look like? And um, let me pull up. Let me pull up a map here. Hopefully, this will get recorded, this as well as as a normal screen. So I'm gonna let's go look at Chicago over here. All right, so here we've got all these interstates out here around Chicago, right? So a radial uh, freeway is like 57 here. It is running right into Chicago. It is hauling people um, into Chicago from down. And 65, maybe a little bit, it, it, it bends around there. But 57 is a good straight shot. 55 is kind of a good straight shot right into town, right? 88, look at that. That's, that's a radial interstate that is radiating out from the center of Chicago. So you can imagine, yeah, people commuting to go to the loop are going to be taking these radial ones. 90 could be to a bit as well, uh, right through there. So let's move that thing off. Uh, 
So that's that's what this urban radial is. So it's a uh, and so you get really high peak factors because everyone is coming into work at once. That gives you a really high peak factor in directional uh, directional split during that peak hour. So that morning commute, you know, you look at pictures. There's not many people going out of town during the morning commute. There's a lot of people coming in, and the opposite in the afternoon. So you'll get a higher D factor at an urban radial like that. Uh, through there. Interurban would just is serving kind of equally all, it's typically like suburbs around the city. It's busy both directions, right? So that'd be more like the tri-state is going to be an intraurban. It's busy in both directions. There's not a high directionality because it's not directly headed right towards the loop where there's a high uh, uh, population of employees, people going to work uh, through that. All right. We already answered that why. Uh, question through there. And then what we want to end up with is what are we designing for? That's the whole point of this, of these factors is figuring out what's our directional design, our volume. And so we did pavement design. It mattered um, how many vehicles were going on one side of the road and then also by lane, right? And so we were designing for that, that peak hour, that design hour that we're looking uh, for. It, it does matter, um, A, what percentage of the ADT is happening during the peak hour, and then what percentage of that peak hour volume is going in a certain direction. And that's what we're trying to get to. And that's how we design appropriately, enough turn lane space, enough turn lanes, and do all of our design uh, from there, is that's what we're gonna use, and we're gonna model it, and put that into our models, right? So what's that right volume uh, through there? All right, so we, we want this at design hour volume, and we want to know the design hour that peak design hour volume in the peak direction during that time. And that's why we call it directional design hour volume, DDHV, which is taking our peaking factor K times our directional split times the average annual daily traffic. And that will give us our directional design hour volume. That's what we're actually designing the road for is this volume, right? That's how many cars are going in one direction on our road during the peak hour of the day. And that's where our DDHV through there. Once you know what your peaking factor is and your directionality split during that peak hour, and if you know, typically this is what we already started with, and then we pull out these K and D factors, we can calculate what, what our road design standards uh, should be for, directional design hour volume, right? And luckily, and this, this shows up all over the place, this is NDOT's webpage, uh, which is showing you the, um, and you can you can find different locations all across the state and they record that and then they're going to show you what the AADT is all right and what the K factor is there's your K factor here's our D factor right and so there's they're showing you so this is a 9% K factor so it's a little bit lower than what the standard tables would have shown us we have a little bit higher directional split so it's probably more commuter people uh, right here in this stretch of US 30 here's campus right up here Right. And you can see the last year that they uh, recorded those through. And you can pull this up. You follow that link uh, from the PDF. You can pull this up and see it uh, in real time. They've got a newer count now. Uh, they do some years they'll do an actual count and some years they just project it forward. And so that's what this growing from whatever it means right through there. They counted it in 2015. The 2016 number was growing from that. And I've actually, I've got, if we can, hopefully this again gets recorded. Uh, through here, here's the latest one out there. <clears throat> you can see the numbers have gone up, right? So they've projected forward uh, all those counts. And let's go to the record here. So here's the record, and it's still loading. You can page up here. Here's what we saw before. Yeah, it was at 9 and 55. They recounted it again in 2018. And so they have a higher uh, volume one in 2018. They didn't recalculate the K and D factor, which is a problem. <laughs> they, hopefully they would uh, through there. I guess we're just going to assume that was pretty stable in the past. It's probably the same number now. No. So for most of their traffic counts, they should be recalculating those factors right through there. Here's our AADT. All right, so it's been going up steadily, right? We've had a steady uh, improvement or increase in that as it moves forward, All right? So we're up to almost 30,000 vehicles a day out here on, on US 30 now. So that's a pretty standard. Down here is the growth factors they've been using, All right? Through there, during the recession, we had negative growth. Uh, some years were zero, and then it, it picked up quite steadily after that, uh, through there. So I just wanted to show you that. That's still active. Um, 
you can still jump on there if you need to know what a traffic count is. Like I say, the state has all those uh, logged in for you. All right, so that's those are some basic factors and it helps us design for traffic signals because what we're actually, the traffic volume that we're, we're designing for with our traffic signals is that directional design hour volume, right? If you have a northbound road or northbound approach to a signal, the numbers you're going to use to to model the traffic signal and then to design how much green time and red time and so forth you get is going to be that directional design hour volume for that northbound movement and so that's what we're going to look at so traffic signals what's what's good and what's bad about traffic signals <clears throat> just think about that in your mind what do you hate about traffic signals and what do you think is maybe good about traffic signals Hearing no response, I'll move on. The our advantages of the number one is, and the reason that they started is is reducing crashes. Right, who has who has priority? Who has the right of way to pass through the intersection at a certain time? And so you're you're controlling that, right? You can obviously it's bad if uh, people both going north and people going west think they can go at the same time. That's a very unsafe situation and it causes a lot of wrecks. And so that's that controlling those conflicting movements and reducing crashes. Those are our first two big advantages, right? It's an advantage for pedestrians, right? If there is no, no control, think about it, even a really busy four-way stop. A lot of times as a pedestrian, you're like, did they see me? Is it safe for me to start crossing the road here? At a traffic signal, you'll it, where there are built for pedestrians, you'll have a pedestrian indication, a, uh, we call it a ped head, that will tell you, okay, now it's safe to walk. You'll get the white walk symbol and you'll start across. So it is giving you a dedicated timing. We call that a phase or a split uh, for a pedestrian to cross through there, right? If a really busy road, um, so if you think about Lincoln Way at University where the old Yats was, uh, right there. You know, Lincoln Way is really busy. Um, you may never have gotten a gap to pull out from university and get on to Lincoln Way right there, right? And so side street movements is an important piece. An advantage of a traffic signal is we give the green light. You can, once we know you're there, you'll get the green light and you can move out and get into uh, and get on to Lincoln Way uh, through there. Um, they're more efficient. They improve capacity. And so instead of everyone coming to a stop and then moving forward, um, traffic signals are much more efficient than a four-way stop in almost all uh, locations through there. That improved that improves capacity. That also reduces the amount of delay. That's how much time you waste at the traffic signal. And you've calculated delay right before spring break. We were calculating that. All right. So that's a reduction in delay for there. All right. Um, and as a as a corridor, Lincoln Way all the way down from from downtown out to the roundabout uh, here by campus, that is all uh, pre-programmed and timed, and it should be better uh, as a long if you were going that entire stretch of roads from downtown uh, to the roundabout. That should, if they timed it right, those are all coordinated. That you should get um, you're less likely to stop, and you'll have improved travel time all the way through that because those those traffic signals are all in coordination uh, through there. We'll learn a lot more about coordination in the next few weeks as we go through this. All right, disadvantages they're they're more expensive, right? Putting up a stop sign is the cheapest way to control an intersection, right? Um, traffic signals are expensive to add signalizations around $150,000. Uh, typically and quite often there's an extra lane added somewhere in that but most of that is the actual cost of the equipment and putting it, getting it installed right so it's the installed cost of the signals signal heads the controllers and all that all right the cabinet the big box that sits on the corner uh, that runs everything and if we were in class i'd take you down at some point and show you our traffic signal uh, box there and maybe i'll do a video reveal of a, a traffic signal controller uh, through that for you the that cabinet and all the equipment in it that's that runs you know ten to twenty thousand dollars is right there and that's the brains and the operational pieces of the equipment that's ten to twenty thousand dollars just for that and that's without the foundation and without all the poles and without all the signal heads and and so forth so they're they're not cheap really in the in a big picture in the in a traffic uh, in a public works world hundred fifty thousand dollars isn't that much no, that's not that expensive, right? Even uh, railroad crossing gates cost the same. They're about $150,000 to put up railroad crossing gates. Uh, yeah. So 
it's hard to get much that's cheaper than than this you know so i know that may sound like a lot to you that's more than i make in a year I, probably more than you guys are making in a year um, but from a road agency perspective this isn't that expensive right uh, it is you still have to budget for it uh, it's not it's not chump change even for a road agency but it's not hugely expensive if you did a complete reconstruction of an intersection you're going to be in the one and a half to two and a half million dollar range right and that would include signals or a roundabout or something right a roundabout's typically going to be about two million bucks when they put a roundabout in so so yes there's some costs involved it's more expensive than the traffic uh, stop signs but it's not as bad as it could have been right if you mistime that you can actually hurt traffic flow so if you do a bad job as a signal engineer uh, which might be your job when you graduate you're you're gonna actually hurt traffic uh, through there if you put up traffic signals where they weren't needed we there's a whole section of warrants that we uh, you'll go through in 354 if you put up a, a traffic signal where it's not needed um, they can actually hurt things and cause more crashes right through there some there are winners and losers when you when you time a traffic signal right so this coordination i was talking about on lincoln way that's helping people on lincoln way it's probably increasing delay for people on the side streets but there's fewer people on the side streets and so overall it improves life for everyone as a system but if you're that one person waiting at university you may wait quite a while um, before you get the green light right through there so the, so some movements are losers uh, the side streets tend, are tend to be losers right and if they fail and that's a very uh very dangerous right if the signal goes completely out and is black um it's a if if you ever come up on a signal like that you may or may not be surprised at the number of people who just blow right through it especially on us 30 i've been through some signals there that had failed and were dark you know power is out uh, maybe in that location some people just don't even pay attention legally you're supposed to you're supposed to act like it's a four-way stop if the signal is not lit if there's no indications you're supposed to act like it's a four-way stop a lot of people don't know that or don't notice that there is no light there even though there are signal heads up above the street and that they're supposed to act like a four-way stop and they'll blow right through i see that uh, more than once out on us 30 coming to work through that but in traffic signals we've got three main kinds of operation we call it fixed time free and semi-actuated fixed time is that you always get a certain amount of time for each each movement and we'll talk about the terminology movements and phases and splits coming up but the amount of time you get for green if you're going north the amount of time you get for green any time of the day you come up there is going to be the same same amount you get 60 seconds or 45 seconds whatever it is that's fixed time they never change right free is it's all driven by sensors usually in the road or above the road that know when you're when a car is there and who, it's, it's typically first come first serve whoever uh, needs the green light is going to get it and that's running free and then it'll still you can program it that you get a minimum amount of time uh, on each phase each movement uh, through there but it's it, we call that free operation and it's all driven by the detection in the road and then there's semi-actuated and semi-actuated is uh, like us 30 is semi-actuated almost everywhere is if you're on us 30 it's always going to give you the green unless someone is on the side road and that's the that's the semi-actuated part of it it's not actuated by trucks that's not what semi-actuated means it means that when there's someone on the side road then you actuate uh, through there if it doesn't detect anybody on the side roads sturdy will never get a green light unless someone is there waiting right that's semi-actuated us 30 will always hold green light for us 30 unless someone's on the side road in this case like sturdy by university there uh, through there that's semi-actuated right through that and that can feed in you can use that for actuated coordinated which is again if you've got a series of lights uh, us 30 is actuated coordinated between sturdy and still heavy right you can see that it's well at least i can see uh, during the peak hours of the day that uh, when uh, the light turns red at sturdy um, about 10 seconds later the light it was 20 20 seconds later the light turns red down at Silhavy on us 30. so those are actually coordinated you can see that they always act in in coordination through that um lincoln way is actually coordinated through most of valparaiso uh, through that <clears throat> our book is going to focus on fixed time cycle links and the reason is that fixed time there's some straightforward equations and calculations we can do for that that we can't do if it's actuated right it gets 
uh, you don't always get a green light uh, at each cycle when it's actuated, coordinated, or semi-actuated you know, through there, or even free right, uh, through that. If it's fixed time, then everybody always gets a certain amount of green and we can calculate it. It's a good way to, to get started thinking about traffic signals and how they're timed. Once you get fixed down, then you can understand how things work much better than when they're running free or actuated uh, through that. So we're going to most of the equations we'll hit in the, in the coming lectures is going to be for fixed time signals, right? Um, some background. So how do we, uh, this is again some terminology and understanding how the signal works. Once we understand that, we can we can talk about it, we can use the equations and so forth as we go through. So we, we say this traffic signal is eight phase. A phase is a movement. So a left turn is a phase. A through movement, northbound through is a phase. Um, eastbound through is a phase. Eastbound left is a phase, right? So those we call those phases. And in a, tra in a normal uh, intersection, right, you've, well, you've got two roads crossing. And I don't have any way to draw this, but if you had two roads crossing, here's <laughs> north and south, and east and west, right? Think about that. There's four approaches. Each of those approaches, like northbound, eastbound, southbound, those could each be their own phase from the straight through. You could also then add in, so that's four. Then you could also always add in um, the left turns for each of those phases, eastbound, left, northbound, left, southbound, left, right? There's four more phases and, and, and there you go. There's your eight phases. That's why we have an eight phase diagram. You can add more phases than that. Uh, uh, odd intersections that have a, um, instead of just having four approaches, you've got five approaches uh, coming in at a weird angle, uh, right? Um, through there, you could add phases into it. The standard one is eight phase. That's what we're going to look at uh, first. In an eight phase intersection, even numbers are through movements. And so two and six are usually your main movements, your major road movements. Four and eight are the side road movements uh, through there. Odd numbers indicate left turn. So you've got, um, you know, one, three, five, and seven. Those are all your left turns and they're associated with one movement, northbound or southbound or so, or so forth, right? Add those up, that'd be your eight phases. All right, one through eight, even numbers are going straight through on the different, the four different approaches. Odd numbers are left turns for that. On the main line, they all should add up to seven. On the sides, we did add up to 11. I'm going to show you a diagram here in a second. Normally, I would draw this on the board at this point. But this is, we're online today, so well, I can't draw that for you. Here's an uh, in a traffic signal, County Road 17 and 6. Just wanted to show you. Um, what this looks like uh, through there. In this case, the way the county numbers it, uh, this would be phase two is, is southbound through, phase six is northbound through, phase one is northbound left, phase five right here would be southbound left. You can see it over here, here's that southbound left. Here's a northbound left. This is a double left, but they're all running the same phase. When this when this lane gets the left turn arrow, this lane also has a left turn arrow. They operate together, so they're on a single phase. Even though there's two physical lanes there. This is this lane here is operating uh, on its own phase as a single lane. So it could be either one. And if you look closely here, you can see these kind of circular shapes, or actually octagons, if you were to zoom in on this. Uh, through that, that's the detectors. Those are loops that are uh, saw cut into the pavement. And so we put those down through there. And so that's how we uh, we put those together All right, through that. So those are the actual detectors. Uh, a little hard to see. If you ever see something that looks like a hexagon or a circle cut into the road and it's usually got black sealant in it, that's the detector. If you park on top of that, you're likely to get the light, right? So that's where, that's how you're being detected. And we're going to, we have a whole, we have a whole lecture on that coming up uh, through there. So that's, this is how this is set up. This would be, um, so this is two, six, this is phase four over here, which is the through phase. This is four, phase eight over here, right? In this diagram, we've actually, the state uses this one, they reverse it. Two is their northbound, six is their southbound, right? It's still the same, uh, it's just rotated 180 degrees from what I was, how the county was doing theirs through that. And this is from the INDOT standard uh, manual. So here's phase two, their, their through and right turn phase. Phase six is their southbound through phase in this case. Here's their left turn phases, right? And so I said if you added the main line phases together, two plus five, that would be seven. And so one plus six, that's seven. 
the side road phases, sideline phases, sometimes you call it, you know, you add those together, three plus eight, that's 11, four plus seven, that's 11. So that's one way to double check you put the numbers in the right place on a phase diagram, right? Main line is seven, side road is 11, seven, 11, sounds like a store, that's how I remember it, All right? So you're either, you should be either adding up to seven or you're adding up to 11. Right, through there you can this is a phase diagram this is what we actually show usually on uh, signal set of plans so if you're designing a traffic signal you throw these on the signal plans at some point this is showing what these movements are and so this is phase one this is that southbound left here's that southbound left then it moves over to phase two which is northbound through right and then three then four five six seven eight these are the phase numbers right so we talked about there's eight phases here's those phase numbers and we call this the dual ring uh, diagram. This is ring one, one through four. This is ring two, five through eight. This comes from the old days. You literally had, uh, it's like an old fashioned uh, light timer, right? That just slowly turns around during the day. And when it gets to say 5 p.m., it clicks on and light comes on. And at 8 p.m., it clicks again and the light goes off. That ring is slowly turning. When these were first built, they call it electromechanical. Uh, system that's you had one ring and it was giving uh, as it slowly turned it would uh, you would set your cycle length to be how fast it would turn around so it's 60 second cycling to every 60 seconds it would go through its whole its whole uh, uh, it would turn once in that 60 seconds it was 120 second cycling it would turn once every two minutes right, through there and you'd say okay it'll turn on this light it, and you put a little indicator in it and I've got a video in, I think two lectures ahead you'll see that so that's one ring. They got smarter than the goal. We can do two rings at once. So we got two rings and they're in step with each other as they come through. Typically they're in step with each other through that. <laughs> and that allows you to do the, both this northbound left and the southbound left. All right, this guy over here and this guy over here, right? They can run at the same time, right? So you can get the, you can get a left turn in both of those phases at the same time. Vertically, if you look, both of these can work at the same time safely. All right, through there. And then our through phases, looking at this, they can run safely at the same time, right? You can go northbound over here on phase two, the same time as you're going southbound on phase six. Right? That's safe to do. And so they can run, uh, they can run it in unison at the same time uh, on both of these rings, right, through that. And then you cross this barrier. Well, okay, if you were going northbound, shoom, straight through, you can't fire up this phase seven which is the eastbound left, you can't have people turning left out here at the same time as you're going north, right? That's not safe. You're going to cause a wreck All right, through that. So you can't cross from two into this next, um, this next phasing, right? You can't cross it. They call this a barrier. You can't cross that barrier um, until both of these are done. And then you move into now you've got the three and the seven, both of those left turns, that left turn and this left turn working together. That's safe, right? But you, sh you can never mix two and seven or three and six. That's not safe, right? Nor can you actually uh, ever mix two and three or six and seven. And so we, we set them up like this. And so the, this one is running one ring. This is running the other ring. And you can run vertically anything that's safe uh, is lined up vertically, not horizontally. So, and then if you look at it, you know, our, our timer is moving like this across left to right. It crosses that line and now two and six are running. It crosses that line. Now three and seven are running, crosses this line. Now four and eight are running right through that. So that's how that's set up you know, through there. And I'll talk about protected and permitted uh, later on as we go through. This is from Synchro. This is what it looks like uh, when you program this. And so here's our phase number, phase one, then two, then three, then four. So right, that looks hopefully just like this. One, two, three, four. The scale of the X and Y, or actually it's the X scale, I guess, on this, horizontally is showing you how much time is allocated to each piece. All right through that. That would equal 45 seconds. Our cycle length is only 45 seconds. So super short cycle. All right, through there. Here's a 60 second one. This is graphically showing you, and it's showing you in color. So you can see this is the green phase, and I go to yellow, then I go red. Then I start my phase three, All right, through that, and yellow and red. All right, and look here. I said that uh, two and six can run together. That's safe. Three and seven, All right? Three and seven, that's safe. But now I'm going over here. Four and seven are running at the same time, right? Vertically, four and seven are running at the same time. Is that safe? So here's four, which is 
this eastbound through and seven is eastbound left yes that is still safe those two can run the same time together and so that's they're on separate rings and so the two rings can be uh, you don't have to start each uh, each one at the same time as it crosses and so that's safe that's why you set it up in two different ring uh, uh, programming like that right but then seven has to stop before eight can start whoops back here so seven this this eastbound left has to stop before we allow westbound through to start that's it, phase eight all right so this is safe this is works fine and that's why we that's why these numbers are numbered the way they are it's seven then eight because these are conflicting movements seven should never be able to run at the same time as eight all right and they can't because that's all on the same ring and as you're moving across here those will never line up sometimes three and seven can work together four and seven can work together and actually three and eight could work together safely you could run both of those phases at the same time that's why they're on separate rings all right through there the ones that you know are going to be dangerous um we they're on this they're ordered in number on that same ring so they can't ever work at the same time together and so that's that's our eight phase two ring system so that's uh, I know this is confusing. Uh, you'll get used to it as we, as we go through the terminology in the future, right? Um, here's a video in the notes, in the posted notes. You should be able to follow this link and pull this video up. Um, I've got it here. I'm going to drag it over um, for us to look at. I don't know how well this is going to show up when I do screen recording, right? Probably not that well. Um, so if I can, let's see if I can get this started uh, here. There we go. So I don't know if this is going to record well. It's probably going to be jittery. Watch this on your own if this is jittery. This is from up in Mishawaka. I did a, a project a few years back, but it's a, it's an annotated. Uh, you can see up here these annotations. It's an annotated a description of what's happening at the signal. So this is phase eight. Phase eight is westbound through. And these people are going into this mall over here. And so that's uh, phase eight is moving right now. And none of the other phases actually... Uh, phase four is probably also moving to the same, right? So that was the end of that. Now we've got, this is southbound, all right? So this is phase five, and that's a turn lane. And this is phase two, which is the through lane. These two turn lanes, right? Phase one and phase five are running at the same time, all right? Phase five just ended. Now phase two is supposed to start. People were still hanging out here in the intersection. That's what the problem was. So we were studying this intersection uh, through that. Phase one is this northbound left. You can see this northbound left lane, this is right before Christmas, is stretching back more than half a mile back across this, the toll road bridge here coming into that. That's all, this line of cars back here is all wanting to turn left into the mall. And so it's a problem. Only 13 cars got through on the last phase, all right? Phase two and six are running now and look at all this extra time, all right? This is not well-timed. We have, look at this, nobody's going through on phase six north we're wasting time right here's you can see the green light up here we can see that all that extra time is there in that phase two yeah, coming through and it just keeps going and going down here you can just watch the clicker you can see how much time it's taking uh, to go through all that right this is not well designed this the timing is not all right phase two is ending all right we end that off now it's going to bring up the uh, phase three and seven, which are the two the eastbound and westbound left turns. All right, only one person was going eastbound left. We got all these westbound left turners through there. That ended now the through movements, four and eight start up. And so here's the eastbound through, is it follow that truck? Westbound through is going into the mall and through that. So that's this is how this signal is operating in real time and how these phases look in real life. That's That's why I wanted to show you this video and how this is running through. Now comes up the two turn phases. So phase one and five are running. So five is the southbound left. One is over here. That's the northbound left. And it's a double left. And they are moving into the mall. You'll see they're going to back up. Everybody wants to turn left here to go to the food court. Nobody wants to turn right. They clog that left lane. And look, we stick all these people out in the lane. People are honking. They're mad because now phase two has started. They want to get by. And they can't even get through because this guy, um, he was mad because he had to wait for 20 minutes to turn left out there. So he's clogging the intersection. And by gosh, he is going to get into that darn mall and he's going to buy some food um, through there. So he doesn't care if he makes everybody wait. All right, so that's that's how they look in, in real life. And let's see if I can end the video without ending 
the recording. All right, um, that's all we had for today. Um, check, there should be a quiz posted also through that. You'll have these notes. If those videos didn't look, that the video didn't work well, you can follow the link from the notes. And it should take you right to YouTube and you can watch it on your own. And you can see how the different phases work and how they, uh, in it, they're not well timed, but they're safe. They never ran two phases at the same time that were unsafe uh, uh, through that. Okay, I'll see you next time.